Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. There are things to be enjoyed, even though there are many things to be endured in life. Is that not true? You are enduring certain things right now. But in the midst of that, you can also enjoy certain things right now, such as life. Happiness is found in what you perceive to be that which is bejeweled by God's goodness and mercy. Do you ever wonder why we all have a deep longing for something more? Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy explains that God has written eternity in our hearts. Why does even the most fulfilled life leave us yearning for something greater? And how does this innate sense of the eternal point us to our true purpose? Stick around and find out as we continue a message titled, It's About Time, Part 5. To replay previous parts, visit ktt.org. Right now, let's join Pastor Philip for today's lesson. In the critically acclaimed movie, Dead Poets Society, Robin Williams plays John Keating, an English teacher at an elite New England preparatory school. And if you've seen the movie, there comes this poignant part of the film where on the first day of a new semester, teacher Keating wants to confront the youthful and inbred carelessness and callousness of his students. And to do that, he invites them to leave their desks and to come out into the hallway, a hallway furnished with pictures of young men from past years, a hallway bedacked by trophies of past glories and victories. And there he bids the students to step forward to peruse some of the faces that line that hallway, faces that they don't stop to look at on any given semester. He encourages them to gaze fully into the faces of the past. And as they look, John Keating says this, they're not that different from you, are they? Same haircuts, full of hormones, just like you invincible, just like you feel. The world is their oyster. They believe they're destined for great things, just like many of you. Their eyes are full of hope, just like you. Did they wait until it was too late to make from their lives even one iota of what they were capable? Because you see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. But if you listen real close, you can hear their whisper, their legacy to you. Go on, lean in, listen. And as the students move even closer to those framed photographs, the teacher goes among them, whispering in each of their ears the Latin term carp diem, carp diem. Carp diem. It's a Latin term that means seize the day. And so he tells those boys, seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. It's a very poignant part in the movie. And it teaches us a great lesson. In fact, it's a lesson that Solomon teaches us here in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You see, that sentiment of seizing the day is one that Solomon cherishes and communicates here in the passage before us. Solomon's argument in chapter 3 really begins in chapter 2 and verse 24. Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy the good of its labor because this is from the hand of God. Solomon the preacher reminds everyone that they ought to take life on a day-to-day -day basis as a gift from the hand of a loving God. That's a theme he'll pick up again here in chapter 3. Life is a gift. 
It's not to be squandered. Look at chapter 3 and verse 12. I know that nothing is better for them, speaking of mankind, than to rejoice and do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Solomon is adamant that God has certain purposes for all of us to fulfill, and God has certain pleasures for all of us to enjoy before the sun sets on all of our lives. There's a time to be born, and there's a time to die, and in the in-between, we must seize the day. We must make our mark in life, and we must seize the day confidently, joyfully, and urgently. I think that's a summary of the the message of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We must seize the day confidently. Why? Because as we saw from verse 1 on, God has ordered our lives according to His sovereign plan and within His sovereign purpose. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. And according to verse 11, God will make it all beautiful in His time. God is weaving a beautiful tapestry across the loom of time. And the threads of our life are all part of that beautiful tapestry, the bright threads and the dark threads. We as Christians, we as those who fear God can live confidently. We should seize the day with confidence because we are not at the mercy of blind fate. We are not in the grip of natural law. We live our lives in the palm of His sovereign hand. Seize the day, my friend. Seize it confidently. Because the implication of the sovereignty of God is that in the ultimate sense, every day is a good day, even the bad day. Because He works it all together for good. Remember what we said, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 is the Old Testament counterpart of Romans 8 verse 28. Seize the day, carp diem. Seize the day confidently, seize it joyfully. Solomon says in chapter 2 and then twice in chapter 3, there's nothing better for a man to do than to eat and drink and enjoy the labor of his hands and the fruit of his life. It is from the hand of God. It is a gift from God. What's his point? It's this that there are things to be enjoyed in life, even though there are many things to be endured in life. Is that not true? You are enduring certain things right now, but in the midst of that, you can also enjoy certain things right now, such as life. It will always be the case. That's why happiness is a today thing, because it's not like tomorrow will be so good that you will have no reason not to be happy. No, happiness is a today thing. It's found in the simple things. It's found in what you perceive to be that which is bejeweled by God's goodness and mercy. Oh, we're to seize the day because God has ordered our life and we can seize it confidently. We can seize it joyfully, but we also must seize it urgently. This takes us to the back end of this chapter. Why should we seize the day urgently? Because Solomon tells us that really when it comes down to it, as the animal dies, so man dies. We all go to the one place. We all will fertilize daffodils someday. We will all become worm food someday. That's the destiny of all flesh. And therefore, when you grasp the fact that time is a perishable commodity, then life is not to be wasted. You and I live under the shadow of death. But if that's the case, that should push us out into the light of every new day with great gusto, with passion and purpose to make this day count. Because when you count your days, there's not many. Therefore, apply your heart to wisdom. The approach of death should cause us to run after life. And it is approaching. In fact, if you want to know how near it is, let me give you a website. Just came across it this week, deathclock.com. Look it up. I did this morning. And it wants some data from you, and then it'll compute roughly the day you're going to die. 
I actually put my statistics in today. It asks for your weight. It asks for your sex. It asks, do you drink? Do you smoke? It asks what country you live in. And then it takes that data and given the data that's available to it, it says, hey, you know, bar being struck by lightning and run over unduly by a vehicle, here's probably when it's going to happen. For me, it's going to be the 31st of March, 2039. I'll die at the age of 77 and six months. Who knows? Hope so, actually. Hope so. I'm telling you, in fact, if you go onto the website, it'll actually start a clock and your life will start counting down. <laughs> it's not a bad thing because there's a time to be born and a time to die. And when you understand that, you're going to seize the day. You're not going to sit around on your rear end and waste Monday through Saturday. No, the Christian doesn't do that because Solomon has taught us to seize the day confidently, joyfully, urgently. So let's go back into this passage here and just to look at the remaining um, verses here, really from verse 16 through to the end of the chapter. We made a start. We outlined this chapter as this, the blending of time verses 1 through 8, the sending of time, verses 9 through 15, and now the ending of time, verses 16 through 22. Solomon takes up the themes of death and judgment. Solomon takes up the themes of death and judgment. You see, the culminating issue of Solomon's appointed time discussion is that there actually will be a time for judgment. He brings that up, doesn't he, in verse 17. God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Solomon wants us to seize this thought that in life there is a time for everything, and then at death there's a time for nothing. And what will follow death is judgment. The life we lived, the deeds we did, the thoughts we thought will be judged. We will give an account for our attitudes and for our actions. And Solomon picks that theme up here. He really has before us what the writer of the Hebrews so clearly states. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And uh, we covered the issues before us as Solomon likens man's death to the passing of an animal. We clarified the fact that Solomon is not saying there's no distinction between mankind and the animal kingdom, simply that in one sense there is a similarity. In a sense, the greatest sense of all, that as the animal dies, so do we. But unlike the animal, we face judgment after death as those made in the image of God, those who have immortal souls that will travel through the gates of time out into eternity. Which brings me to two thoughts. As Solomon takes up this thought of death and judgment and eternity, there are two things this text tells us. In fact, we'll reach back into verse 11, but it casts its shadow over the whole chapter. Solomon talks about what we might call the anticipation of eternity, and then Solomon talks about the adjudication of eternity. Let's pick up this theme of the anticipation of eternity. As John MacArthur notes in his study Bible, man's breath or physical life appears on the surface to be little different than that of the animal, but in reality, man's soul differs in that God has made him eternal. Look at verse 11. Speaking of God, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has put eternity in the heart of man. Mark that. You and I need to realize that Every one of us is a pilgrim soul, a wayfarer, someone journeying through time and space to a place of endless existence. This life is but the preface of a never-ending story because we all go to the one place, but the soul of man does go upward, and then he faces the judgment so you and I need to anticipate this. In fact, when you scratch beneath the surface, we do anticipate it because God has put eternity in our hearts. Now, let me just say this. The whole thought of eternity is something that, that our intellect doesn't have the bandwidth for. 
We are creatures of time. We live within the boundaries of our everyday experience, but there is a dimension to life that is timeless, and we don't think enough about it. We've become blind to this concept. We've become so rooted in life that we forget that someday we will live forever somewhere. And it will either be glorious in the presence of Jesus Christ or it will be horrid and dark should we die without Jesus Christ. All preachers have used this as a kind of illustration for eternity. Visualize a bird coming to earth every million years, taking one grain of sand to a distant planet. At that rate, it would take thousands of billions of years before the bird would carry away a single handful of sand. Then multiply that. It's just beyond our comprehension. Multiply that. How long would it take that bird to say, gather up the sand of Newport Beach and Huntington Beach and Long Beach? Thousands and thousands and thousands of billions of billions of years. What about removing the earth grain by grain? It's incomprehensible. But even if the bird should do it, On the day the last grain of this planet is transported to that other planet, eternity will not have officially begun. It is appointed unto man once to die and then. There's a then. There's an after. Then judgment. And our destinies will be determined forever with God through Christ, without God, because we're without Christ. Oh, we need to think about it. And you know what? When you scratch beneath the surface of a man's thinking, he does think about it because God has planted that idea in his heart. Solomon believes that God has sown into the lining of a man's soul a sense of concern for his future. Man is fascinated with his fate. He's innately curious about his destiny. Man has a deep-seated inquisitiveness about what lies ahead. He knows that this life is but the beginning and death is not the end. That's why man is incurably religious. Lenin even acknowledged that, didn't he? That religion is the opium of the people. But he didn't get it. He thought they'd been duped. They needed to be free from that mythology and, and silliness. But he didn't understand the nature of man. Man isn't an animal. It can be harnessed for some communist system. Man is a fallen creature made after the image of a glorious God who innately knows that there's more. He has an ache in his heart for the transcendent. He believes in the extraterrestrial, the supernatural. He has, he does, he will. That's why, by the way, when all the communist countries fell, People went back to the churches, to the mosques, to the synagogues, because all the communists could do was muffle that inbred, innate knowledge that there's something more. Something more to this life. There's an afterlife because God has put it in our hearts. You know, when Paul gets to Athens, Acts chapter 17, he notices this statue to the unknown God amidst a plethora of idols. And what does he say to them? I perceive that you're very religious. Every culture is like that because God has put eternity in their hearts. Australian Aborigines pictured heaven as a distant island beyond the western horizon. Mexicans, Peruvians, Polynesians believed that they went to the sun or the moon after death. Native Americans believed that in the afterlife their spirits would hunt for the spirits of the buffalo. In the pyramids of Egypt, the embalmed bodies that had maps placed beside them to guide the pharaohs into the future world. The Romans believed that the righteous would picnic in Elysian fields while their horses would graze nearby. Remember that scene in the movie Gladiator? The fields, the horse. It's Roman thought of the afterlife. It's whatever culture you look at, 
Anthropology gives evidence to the fact that there's this God-given innate sense of the eternal. Misguided, deceived often, but it's there. Solomon recognizes that because we are going to live forever somewhere. And this passage tells us that man has this anticipation of eternity. And remember, that's the whole thesis of the book. Solomon tried to fill an above-the-sun hunger with an under-the-sun lifestyle, and it didn't work. Why couldn't he find ultimate satisfaction? Why couldn't he just get to that place of, even momentarily, of perfect happiness? And if anybody could have done it, this man, he could buy anything, have anything, have anyone he wanted. But there was a big gaping hole in his heart. Why? Because he was made by God, for God, and without God, he couldn't be his true self. Without God, he couldn't enjoy real life. That's why Augustine, the church father, said that there is a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts that cannot be filled by any created thing. That vacuum can only be filled by the Creator. Listen to these telling words. I think they're good words by C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. Quote, Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist. A baby feels hunger. Well, there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there's such a thing as the companion of a female. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, only to arouse the suggestion of the real thing. My friend, we're lost. Thank God Jesus didn't leave us in that lost state. He said, I came to seek and save those who are lost. <laughs> Hope you find Christ because in Him you find that real life experience. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, a message titled, It's About Time, Part 5. To access the complete message, visit ktt.org. At Know the Truth, it's our mission to share the gospel with a world in need of truth so that you can be encouraged, equipped, and engaged in both living out and sharing the gospel. This month, we're featuring a resource that will help you do just that. It's called Following Jesus in an Age of Quitters. This powerful devotional brings the spiritual discipline of one of America's great theologians into the 21st century. In 1722, an 18-year-old Jonathan Edwards penned 70 resolutions that guided his spiritual life for decades. And now you can explore these transformative principles through 70 engaging devotionals that will equip you to live out your faith with renewed vigor and commitment. You can request a copy of Following Jesus in an Age of Quitters by giving a gift of any amount to know the truth. Just call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. Philip? Hey, Pastor Philip again, inviting you to join me October the 7th for the first annual Know the Truth Golf Tournament and Dinner. We are excited. Enjoy a great day of golf, win prizes, and share a time of fellowship on the links and during dinner later in the day. You'll hear from me as I share stories and exciting updates about the Know the Truth ministry. You need to know this. All funds raised from the tournament will support Know the Truth and its work of sharing the gospel with a world in need of truth through their preaching and teaching of God's Word unashamed. I hope to see you and your friends there. You can learn more and register online at ktt.org. All right. Thank you, Philip. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Come back tomorrow when we conclude this message titled, It's About Time. That's Wednesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.